Sony announced the now legendary PXW FS7 over five years ago at IBC 2014, and this year announced the long-awaited update, the PXW FX9. But is it worth the upgrade over the now industry standard FS7? Well, let's take a look. We were lucky enough to get hold of a pre-production version of the FX9 for a few days last week and put it through its paces. As with our normal in-depth reviews, we'll be breaking this video into several segments, which you can see timestamps for here. Let's start looking at the camera body itself. The FX9 features a grey finish which makes it look more like a Venice than an FS7, though there is a black pre-production unit floating about also. The FX9 is a lot more angular than the FS7 and is a little bigger. The FX9 is also a little heavier than the FS7, weighing in around 4.8 kilograms with the viewfinder, eyepiece, grip remote control, BPU35 battery, SELP28135 G lens, an XQD memory card, handle, mic holder, all attached. Whereas the FS7 with those same accessories weighed in around 4.5 kilograms. That's not a lot, but when you've got it on your shoulder all day, it will make a difference. So the bottom of the camera has some similarities to the FS7, but also has some changes. It features the same quarter inch thread, locking pin locator and 3 8 inch thread for mounting the camera securely no matter the rigging, and also features a sliding shoulder pad. However, this has been tweaked. You can adjust or remove the pad on the bottom by using the three 2.5 millimeter Allen screws. The pad is now much flatter and the curve concave that was there in the FS7 is slightly different and more angular. This means you can use most universal shoulder plates with it fine, but ones that curve with the FS7 may not work, so be careful there. Or just keep an eye on the comments for when we get around to testing a whole bunch of them. As you expect, all the regular rig manufacturers are making full rigs for the camera, so you'll be able to rig the camera up exactly as you like it. The top of the camera features the same top handle that uses these four mounting points as the FS7. This means that all your FS7 top plates will mount fine. The top handle, mic holder, and viewfinder bracket is also the same as the FS7. However, the screen itself and the loop have seen some changes. The loop now uses a new mounting mechanism, which is much nicer than the FS7 Mark II one, and now features improvements to reduce how easy it is for the thing to get steamed up. The monitor itself has seen massive improvement. It now has a resolution of 1280 by 720 instead of the 960 by 540 from the FS7. With this, they've also improved the color and contrast of the screen. And this was one thing that stood out to me. When you're using it, it more as a viewfinder, it's so obvious how much better this screen is. You now have an assignable button on the side of the screen also, instead of the contrast dial on the FS7. The top handle is the same as the FS7, featuring the handy record and zoom rocker and optional cold shoe mount on the back. And of course, the MI shoe. Just like the FS7, you can use this with a range of accessories Sony have produced for it. This means you can have four channels of audio by using a dual channel receiver on the top and the two XLR inputs on the side of the body. The original UWP system was good, but some users did experience some interference. So I want to do some more testing with the new DWP system and the FX9 to see if Sony have solved some of the audio issues the FS7 had, but that will be in a later video. Moving on to the front, the front features the same locking E-mount as the FS7 Mark II, which I have a love-hate relationship with. It will take some getting used to if you're coming from regular E-mount, but the key thing to remember is to line up all of the white dots and then twist the lock. When mounted correctly, you will hear a click. This mount is much more secure than regular E-mount. It does make sense that Sony have used it with the huge array of lenses you can mount onto it, but for running on operators, locking E-mount is still nowhere near as practical as regular E-mount, as it's incredibly fiddly to change a lens one-handed, not to mention dangerous for your precious glass. But E-mount is great. It's fast and it's extremely short flange distance means you can pretty much put any lens you could ever want onto it. Whether that's PL, EF, or some old vintage lenses, all of your existing manual E-mount adapters will work fine with the FX9. I did manage to pop a few different electronic adapters on the front of the camera to see if any would work. Obviously the camera's not out yet, and I doubt many of these adapter manufacturers have updated these adapters with the correct firmware to communicate with the FX9. I tested the latest model Metabone Speed Booster, Sigma's MC11, and a random photodiox adapter. 
The Metabones didn't pass through data, but did enable aperture control, but didn't allow autofocus. The MC11 was the same, and the Photodarks was the same, but would bug out every now and then when controlling aperture. Fingers crossed we can get the same level of autofocus and communication that the a7 III has with the MC11 and EF mount Sigma lenses, but only more time and testing will tell. Anyway, behind the C mount is the new full frame 6K 35.7 by 18.8 mm back illuminated Exmor R CMOS sensor. This sensor is stated to have 15 plus stops of dynamic range and has a resolution of 6008 by 3168. Though the sensor is 6K, the camera cannot shoot 6K internally or externally currently. So right now it downsamples the full 6K sensor into a 4K image. This should give you a nice detailed 4K image with low noise and good color. But we will be the judge of that in our more controlled tests later on. The sensor also has a dual base ISO of 800 and 4000. This is a welcome addition as the native ISO for the FS7 was 2000. So having the option to switch between the two will make the camera so much more versatile in varied lighting conditions. We will come back to the sensor in a bit though. There's also a white balance set button, which when in auto white balance allows you to quickly set your white balance. You also have a front tally light in the same position as the FS7. So let's move on to the operator side of the camera. A good few things have changed on the operator side of the camera. However, if you are used to the operating experience of the FS7, you shouldn't have much trouble getting used to the new layout. There have been some pretty big upgrades here in usability though. One of which is how you operate the ND. Sony have used the same ND system from the FS7 Mark II, but made the NDs larger to cover the larger sensor. The controls have now been separated out onto its own set of buttons and dial. With this, you can switch between the physical stops, electronic variable ND, or auto ND. This will make operating the camera much faster and means you can use the multi-function dial to control either ISO, white balance, or shutter. You can easily switch between the stepped ND or variable using the switch. You can even toggle on auto ND, which will automatically adjust the amount of ND as you're shooting. This can work, but sometimes can look a bit jarring when going from extreme exposure to differences in light, or if the camera meters something is slightly wrong. But still, this will be a very handy feature to have at your fingertips. One little detail about the ND that has seen improvement is the clear setting. Before, with the FS7 Mark II and the FS5 Mark II, the clear setting meant that there was no glass covering the sensor, whereas now there is a clear filter in its place. This means that you will not have any shifts in back focus when changing between ND and clear. The gain and white balance switches from the FS5 and the FS7 make a return and stay in the same position and keep the same function. You can define what each one of those does in the menu, and with the gain or ISO dial, you can choose individual presets for both low and high base ISO modes. One really nice addition is the addition of the little lights added on all of the buttons for settings that have auto modes. You can now hold down the setting you would like to set to auto, and then use the multi-function dial to go into auto. This means it's much harder to actually go into an auto mode, unlike the FS7. As well as this, the lights on each of these little buttons also now light up when you're in auto. This means you can simply glance at the side of the camera and see if any of your settings are in auto mode. This small detail will mean a lot of save shots once shooters get used to checking. You also have the addition of a new set of buttons to navigate the menu system instead of the scroll wheel button featured on the FS7. This button will be much nicer to operate from an AC perspective. It took me a little bit of time to get used to, and one thing I think could be improved is how the buttons feel, both to the touch and to click. I think they need to be a little bit more raised and have a slightly greater travel distance. Though my favorite way to navigate the camera now is to use the multi-function dial at the front. Not only does this make it extremely easy to quickly go through all of your key settings and make adjustments, or an adjustment which you can define when you turn it, but it also is great to navigate through the menus when you can't reach the arrow keys. Another welcome addition is a few extra audio controls. You can now control the potential four channels of audio on the side of the camera, which is a feature a lot of FS7 users have craved. You also now have two volume control buttons, so you can adjust your monitor audio quickly and easily. The FX9 uses XQD cards as its primary recording media, just like the FS7. Sony have changed the mechanism to release the door from a push button on the FS7 to more of a switch on the FX9. I found this to be a bit more sturdy than the FS7 and harder to accidentally knock. They have also added more weatherproofing around the inside of the door. 
You have two slots, which depending on your recording mode dictate how they are written to. You can also record to both cards simultaneously in certain modes. You have two nice big lights to let you know if data is still being written to the card, where green it means it's ready to remove and red means it's still being accessed. In terms of XQD card compatibility, pretty much any of the regular brands and speeds recommended for the FS7 will work with the FX9, as the bit rates have not changed. In regards to how these data rates translate into card record times, obviously it depends on the bit rate of what you're shooting, but here's a handy little table to give you an idea. You also have a good few more user customizable buttons. The original FS7 had six, and the Mark II and FX9 now have 10. On the FX9, you have one, two, three, seven, eight, and nine on the camera's operating side. Number 10 is on the screen, and four, five, and six are on the hand grip. All of these can be redefined to a range of functions. This means you can fully tailor the camera's layout to your most used menu settings to make navigating and making changes much easier without having to delve deep into the menu system. One function I'm very happy to see bindable is the switch between the low and high base ISO. This makes switching between the two pretty much instantaneous. This will be incredibly handy for quick run and gun scenarios where your lighting conditions are going to change massively, such as going from a dark interior to daylight. They have also changed the position of the headphone jack from the top of the body to the bottom. Moving on to the back. The FX9 uses the same BPU battery as the FS7 and FS5 has, but Sony have released a few new larger capacity versions to replace the old 30, 60 and 90. These will be the BPU 35, 70 and 100. However, you will still be able to use the old versions with this new camera. Sony actually give the exact power consumption on their website, and the FX9 while recording XAVCI Quad HD at 60 frames a second with the 28-135 lens on and the viewfinder on, but with no external devices drawing power, it's around 35.2 watts, and the equivalent setup with the FS7 equals around 19 watts. From our time using the camera, we seem to get around an hour and a half battery life with a BPU60. You also have a DC port on the top right. However, one thing to note is that this is a 19.5 volt input versus the 12 volt of the original FS7. You also have the large connection for the XTCA here, which like the previous FS7 cameras, has a cover hiding it. The XTCA FX9 will feature 16-bit raw output with a future update, which is awesome. Atomos have already confirmed support for this and I really can't wait to see some footage. The XTCA will allow you to use V-Lock batteries, has an RJ45 port, dual USB ports for dual link, the ability to use DWX drop-in audio solutions, which will be great for run and gun broadcasts, guys, as well as a D-tap out and a four pin high rose. I'm interested to see what third party solutions come out for power distribution for this. Towards the back, you can start to see some of the new IO on the right of the camera. So let's take a look at that. On this side, you have a bunch of inputs and outputs. You have two SDI outputs, a timecode in and out, genlock in and ref out, and HDMI out. This addition of timecode and genlock on the camera body itself without needing to add on the XTCA will be a welcome addition by so many people and its simple implementation here is very welcomed. You then have your v viewfinder connection port which looks very similar to the FS7. You then have two XLR inputs with controls and your standard rosette for attaching the fantastic arm and grip that come in the box. The grip has seen a few ergonomic changes and after using it, it does feel nicer it also now uses Sony's multi-connection instead of the old remote type. The multi-connection is much faster and you can feel the difference when zooming, especially with the 28-135 servo lens. You can also use both the multi and remote ports simultaneously, so I am intrigued to see how users take advantage of this. The actual arm that is attaching the grip hasn't changed since the FS7. I think this is a missed opportunity from Sony to make this better. However, you can get the awesome shape arm which will make it much quicker to adjust. I do wish as well that you could remove the grip the same way you can with other side handles. Anyway, that's a quick physical rundown of the camera. Let's have a look at some of the more interesting parts in the menu system. The menu system has changed a decent amount since the FS7. Sony have clearly tried to segment the settings out into a few logical submenus. User, shooting, project, paint, timecode and media, monitoring, audio, thumbnail, technical, network and maintenance. The menus have definitely improved over the FS7, and when you pair that with the improved button layout of the camera, it makes accessing all of the crucial settings faster. Just like the FS7 before it, this camera has both the option to shoot in custom or Cine EI mode. In custom mode, the camera will behave like a regular video camera. In Cine EI, it's more like a digital film camera. 
Working with Cine AI mode may be a bit weird at first, but it's actually quite simple. In this mode, you use exposure index ratings instead of ISO or gain when exposing your image. As you go up and down the exposure index range, you are changing the LUT brightness in your viewfinder, not the ISO or gain of the sensor. So with the FX9, you can switch between the 800 and 4000 base ISOs, and then your EI within that. The benefit of using EI is so you can use a lower EI value while the camera records its base sensitivity, and the LUT brightness allows you to monitor the adjusted exposure. This means if you shoot at 800 base ISO at 400 EI, you are overexposing the image by a stop, and then in post, you can then pull your levels down. This will improve the signal to noise ratio of your image, but could lead to clipping in the highlights depending on the scene. This mode is handy if you're in a more controlled environment and want the absolute best out of the camera, but for most people, the ability to add gain in camera in custom mode is going to be the way to go. During Asa Chapman's fantastic talk at Vocas, he mentioned something interesting, which is using gain instead of ISO when in custom mode. This is because when in custom, the gamma curve dictates the base sensitivity, whereas in Cine EI, it's always 800 and 4000, as you can't change the gamma. If you switch between different gammas in custom, the lowest ISO value that you can get to on the bottom of the monitor is your base in that gamma. But because this changes depending on the high or low base and the gamma curve that you're using, there is a lot of combinations to remember, and you may be better off shooting with dB instead of ISO, so you always understand how close you are to your base. Your base would be 0 dB, which will be your optimal settings for noise performance or even going negative for less noise if you choose. Each addition of adding 6 dB doubles your noise. The stops in gain mode are also smaller than the third stop increments in ISO. But obviously, you can switch between the two different modes, do some tests, and see what works for you. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention it was uh, you can now auto white balance in Cine AI, which is good. The FX9 now features new and improved color science over the FS7 that is trying to get it as close as possible to the Venice. You can change and shoot in a range of different gammas and color matrix. The standard in custom mode is now s cinetone which is labelled as original in the gammas and s cinetone in the colour matrix. This colour profile has been designed to mimic the Sony Venice colour science, with the focus being the quick acquisition of great looking imagery that strikes a balance between cinematic and video. You then have your standard modes in gamma and colour, which are if you want to match the camera with legacy Sony cameras. You then have hyper gamma, and lastly you have S-Log3, which you can shoot in both Cine EI or custom mode. You also have a range of colour matrix depending on what you need. The proxy and sub record modes are pretty handy. You can be shooting full XAVCI or L UHD at up to 60 frames a second while recording a 1080p MPEG HD 4 2 at the same frame rate you are recording your master at as a proxy. You can also bake in a LUT into the MPEG clips while still recording log for your XAVC masters. This means you can hand off these proxies off to an editor to edit easily before then replacing and rendering with your full size XAVC clips. These proxies are then recorded onto the same card you are recording to in a subfolder. The FX9 has seen an upgrade to its I.O. as it now features a 12G SDI and a 3G SDI. The 12G SDI can output 4K 60p 42 10 bit and the HDMI can output 4K 30p 42 10 bit. This means you could pair this with a Ninja 5 or one of the new Blackmagic video assists and record 10 bit ProRes externally. We didn't get a chance to test how this footage looks, but it's something we do want to explore more. The FX9 also features an intervalometer built in, which will be a handy little feature if you can't carry around a DSLR or mirrorless camera for it. You can set the interval time, which is between one second and 24 hours, and the number of frames. Then the only limiting factor is your power and media storage. This, with the increased sensitivity of the sensor, could make for some really interesting night time lapses. You can use this intervalometer with auto exposure also, so you can leave the camera and let it do its thing without worrying about varied lighting conditions. Like past Sony cameras, the FX9 features a picture cache record. This is a buffer pre-record mode. In this, you can define how long before you hit the record button, the camera records and then saves. This would be perfect for a range of different productions, but one that comes to mind would be nature documentaries. You could have the camera set up, not recording, be watching and ready for an animal to do something, and then once the animal does what you're waiting for, hit record and it will, be re and it will record both sound and video for a defined amount of time. This would be very handy in reducing wasted storage space and make your editor's job a little easier. The amount of time that you can have pre-recorded depends on the resolution and codec you are shooting in. 
the max being 28 seconds when shooting in HD, XAVC-L and MPEG HD, up to 8 seconds in UHD, XAVC-I at 24 or 25p, and up to 4 seconds in UHD, XAVC-I at 30, 50 and 60p. The CBM or camera control app that Sony are planning on releasing with the camera is not currently released, so I didn't manage to get test it. However, it does promise a lot. You can have up to eight devices connected to the camera with a low latency wireless image transmission, full camera control, proxy viewing while the camera is doing another operation wirelessly. You can remotely access the camera via both an iOS or Android app, as well as IP connection via a web browser. And um, with the camera's increased connectivity options using the XTCA, built-in Wi-Fi, NFC, and GPS, this can make for a very powerful live streaming and quick acquisition and turnaround camera. There isn't currently an anamorphic mode in camera. However, that doesn't mean you can't shoot anamorphic. It just means that it's not quite as easy as some of the other options on the market. If you add either an EVF like the Gratical Eye or a monitor that has a D-squeeze option like the Cine 7, then you'll be able to at least monitor it. However, I do wish that Sony would add the option to apply D-squeezes in camera and maybe even specific anamorphic shooting formats. So please Sony, I know you're already working on a lot, but this would be awesome. Now, I haven't covered every single thing in the menu, but here are a few quick bits to mention. As with the FS7, you can save your setup menu settings onto an SD card and then import them into another FX9. This means you can create the perfect setup for you and then ingest it onto another FX9 if you rent a second unit in, for example. You also have the same in-depth metadata options that the FS7 had. You also have zebras for exposing, center marks, safety areas, aspect markers, as well as a few more options for monitoring. There is also a battery alarm that will beep at you when it gets near to the end of the power. One thing that I've had a few conversations with people about is about Sony implementing a more basic menu system as standard, and then a more technical one that you can toggle. They could do this in a number of ways. They could copy the Venice one, which uses a short press for the quick menu, and then a long press for the deeper one, or the method I think would be better, which would be a toggle in the menu between the two. That way you can set the camera up before shoot in the technical menu and then hide everything that you're likely not gonna use while shooting. This simplification is kind of possible with the user customizable menu, but a simpler and easier navigate menu would make a lot of users happy. Anyway, let's move on to some more focused tech specs about the camera. One of the most compelling new features of the FX9 is its dual native sensor. This sensor now has two separate base ISOs, the low one being 800 and the high one being 4000. This is going to completely transform the versatility of this camera. The FS7 was already widely used across a range of productions and certainly documentary and broadcast was one of its biggest user bases. These types of productions are going to welcome this change as the FS7's base ISO of 2000 was noisy at the best of times and this isn't the case with the FX9. These two separate ISO values are fundamentally changing how the sensor is gathering light. It's not adding gain like a camera with a single sensitivity. Both of these base ISOs should have the same amount of dummy range and a similar amount of noise. If you want to see some test footage, you'll have to wait around till our more control tests. The camera will be receiving an update in the future, which will change the available codecs and frame rates. So this video will be what the camera can do at release. Currently, the camera is restricted to Quad HD or 3840 by 2160, but will receive an update that will unlock DCI 4K. You can currently record up to 30p in the full frame 6K mode, but when in 4K Super 35 mode, you can record up to 60p. In 1080p, you can shoot at up to 120 frames a second in both full frame and Super 35 crop modes. Eventually, you'll be able to record full frame 4K up to 60p and full frame 2K up to 180 frames per second as well as having the option to record 120 frames a second 4K in the Super 35 imaging mode via the raw output. These are a decent set of frame rates and I'm confident Sony will output them in a timely manner like they have with so many cameras in the past. There are currently three codecs available internally, XAVCI or Intra, XAVCL or Longop, and an MPEG HD 42. Here is a table of all the current specs of these different codecs. Switching between imaging modes is faster than the FS7, but could be improved. It would be great for the camera to have the ability to assign imaging modes and frame rate switches to single button presses. As and when Sony releases the firmware for the FX9, we'll be announcing update videos, so make sure you hit subscribe and hit the bell to be notified as soon as that's released. One thing many people wanted from this camera was a 2K center scan mode, similar to that of the previous F cameras. And unfortunately, there isn't one in this camera currently. 
I have heard conflicting things from Sony about whether or not this will be added in the future firmware updates, so I guess we'll just have to wait and see. As with the rest of Sony's family of cameras, the FX9 features a slow and quick mode. Currently, you can shoot at up to 120 frames per second while you're in 2K mode. However, Sony will be introducing a 180 frames per second option in a future update. What frame rate you can go up to depends on what resolution you're in. However, you can go from max down to one frame a second in some pretty small increments, which is nice. When you're selecting your base frame rate, you are choosing the frame rate that, you are, that your slow and quick frame rate will play back at in your software of choice. One thing to note is that as soon as you go into slow and quick mode, you lose all autofocus capabilities, which is a shame. But I guess this is a limitation of the processing power that the camera can handle. One, round, one way around this is to change your base to 50, for example, instead of using slow and quick. Though this does add an extra step in post, it does mean you'll be able to use the fantastic autofocus, which we'll be taking a look at now. One other serious improvement that the FX9 has over the FS7 is the implementation of the same autofocus system as the latest Alpha series cameras. This means that the old slow contrast based AF from the FS7 has gone and the new snappy phase detection and contrast based AF is here and it's absolutely fantastic. The autofocus has 561 points and covers 94% of the horizontal and 96% of the vertical frame. That's a huge amount. You can also customize your autofocus pretty heavily. AF transition speed is how fast the camera will pull focus. So if you want a focus pull to look more natural, you can slow it down. And if you're shooting sports where you want it to be as quick as possible, you just crank it up to seven. You then have AF subject shift sensitivity, which enables you to change if you want the autofocus to lock onto a subject or be very sensitive and change between subjects. This would be great if you're doing a walk and talk in a busy environment and want to keep your subject locked in focus. Focus area and focus area AFS allow you to select different areas that the autofocus will work in. You can then position the little brackets accordingly and get very precise with the autofocus. I really like the flexible spot setting as you can be really accurate and use the directional joystick on the hand grip to move it around very quickly. You then have a few different face detection modes. Face only, which will only autofocus when it recognizes a face. Face priority, which will still use Sony's AI to autofocus on what it thinks is the key subject in the frame but prioritizing faces when they're in frame and then off, which is just regular autofocus with no face detection. The face detection is really good and you can even have up to eight different faces in the frame and switch between them. You also have push AF mode, which you can choose between AF and single shot AF. This is changing how the push AF button works. You then have AF assist, which can be set up while using manual focus to give you a hand to just reach your focus point. This works pretty well in practice. Sony will also be introducing their fantastic IAF feature at some point, which Alpha Series users rave about, so that'll be interesting to see. Honestly, this level of water focus in a Sony camera of this quality and design is a massive improvement, and I think it may even give Canon's DAF a run for its money, so that's what we did. We took Canon's new C500 Mark II and the FX9 and put the AF to the test. For this test, we took the cameras outside, used the both latest 7200s from each brand, I cranked up the sensitivity to max on both and turned on face tracking. We set up next to a fence so we can see the distance difference that both the cameras snap onto Joe's face. The FX9 snaps on a decent amount sooner than the C500 Mark II, which surprised me. Canon's DAF is really impressive and so I actually did the test again because I questioned whether something had caused it, but after running the test again, the C500 is still the same. Sony have done an amazing job at implementing this system over to this camera. And I think it really does rival Canon's amazing autofocus system. Though I would say both have different pros and cons. So I do kind of want to do a more comprehensive video looking at the differences in performance and features. But if you want to see that video, then let us know in the comments below. Anyway, I think for a lot of users, this is going to be an awesome addition to the Sony's line of PXW-F series of cameras. As well as autofocus, you also have some great manual focus tools, such as a focus magnifier, which is a three times and then a six times punch in, and some very customizable focus peaking. Sony's implementation of IBIS here is interesting as it's metadata based. At the time of recording this video review, this feature wasn't available yet, but we will be doing firmware update videos as and when the new firmware gets released by Sony. This feature records the gyro movements into the metadata of the clip. So when you hit post, your software of choice will not have to analyze anything, which means much faster effect application times over the more common stabilization tools. This is currently only available in Sony's Catalyst browser, but 
Apparently they are talking to other companies about implementing it into other NLE systems. This is an interesting way of handling stabilization, but it is still unclear if this is going to be locked down to just Sony lenses, or if adapted or third-party E-mount lenses will be able to do this also. But let's wait and see. One little caveat is that you can't combine lens IS with this IBIS metadata option, which I guess would require more processing power so the camera could understand what the lens is doing to counteract movement. All right, let's look at some uh, control tests. We shot a range of comparisons with the FX9, FS7, and C500 Mark II, as well as the Venice. We chose these three cameras to compare the FX9 to, as we feel like it represents most of what people are going to be comparing it to. The FS7 will be people wondering if it's worth the upgrade. The C500 Mark II, as it's competing pretty closely with it this generation, and the Venice, because it's Sony's no compromise cine workhorse. We shot ISO comparisons, overexposure tests, and underexposure tests. Let's start off with ISO. For this, we set up using a Kino Flow Select 30 as our key light and a light panels at Gemini 1x1 as our fill and a DLED 7 up high for the edge light. We then had the two digital Sputnik Voyages in the background also. We exposed using our Sconic Light Meter for mid-gray. Our base exposure with the FX9 was ISO 800, T2, 25p with a 180 degree shutter and used the aperture on our 50mm Sigma Cine lens to keep our exposure consistent as we went through the ISO range. For the FX9 and FS7, we shot in both S-Log3 and in custom B defaults. I think the Venice looks the best in the higher ISOs, but that's, that's no surprise. I would say the FX9 is second with very impressive performance at 12,800 ISO. The C400 Mark II does a surprisingly good job at 12,800 ISO also, considering its base ISO is only 800. Not surprising, the FS7 is by far the worst, especially when you're comparing the S-Log3 footage. But there's also a big difference between the two custom default clips from the FS7 and FX9. The FX9 is cleaner in custom mode than it is in log. And I would say it's very, very usable at 12,800. A tiny bit of denoising wouldn't go and miss though. Overall, the FX9 does a fantastic job towards the higher ISOs in its range, and having the option of a clean 800 and 4000 base ISO over the very noisy 2000 of the FS7 is a huge improvement. For existing FS7 shooters who have to react to the light in front of them, this will completely transform how you shoot. For our over and under exposure tests, we shot at both base ISOs on the FX9. Like our ISO tests, we lit for mid-grey on our colour chart, and use the aperture on our 50mm Sigma Cine lens to adjust exposure a stop at a time. As you expect, the Sony Venice does an incredible job at reaching into those shadows and somehow pulling back a crazy amount of colour. Even at six stops under, colours are decently accurate and it's got the least amount of noise. The FX9 again does a really good job at holding on to colour at even minus six stops, though it is a good amount noisier than the Venice and doesn't hold on to detail as well. The colour seems to shift a little when looking at the FX9 at 800 and 4000 ISO, with the 800 looking a bit greener but seems a little clearer. The FS7, while very noisy from around 4 stops out under, does a pretty decent job at holding on to colour and actually looks a little cleaner than the FX9. The worst performer here was the C500 Mark II. I was actually extremely shocked by this. We did the same test during our last C500 video and used the same methodology. However, we shot in CRM, not XFAVC, and oh boy does that make a difference. From around minus four stops, the color starts getting extremely dicey, and by six stops, it's pretty awful. So the lesson here is to shoot CRM when you're underexposing with the C500 Mark II. Let's move on to some overexposure. We use the same methodology here, but basically closed the lens down to T11. Turned our lights up to expose from mid-gray and then opened up a stop at a time down to T1.5 or plus six. As you expect from the last two tests, the Venice did an amazing job. Unfortunately, Joe didn't check the focus while opening up the lens, so it does get a bit soft at plus six. 
At plus six, skin only breaks a small amount on my cheek and color is held really well. The FX9 does a remarkable job at plus five at both ISOs. It holds color and skin really well before breaking its plus six. But considering the price of the camera, this is pretty impressive. At plus six, I do think this, the 4000 base ISO handles it a little better with less skin breaking up and better color. Overexposing the C400 Mark II and XFVC is a similar story to underexposing. Our last tests look much better in CRM and in XFAVC it starts to really break and have major color issues. Though this is better than the FS7 which completely falls apart at four stops over and is completely unusable past that point. Overall, it's interesting to see the difference between XAVC and the C500 Mark II, but if you're comparing compressed codec to compressed codec, the FX9 has both the FS7 and C500 Mark II beat in under and over exposure. While it doesn't perform as good as the Venice, I didn't expect it to. The Venice is £35,000, while the FX9 costs a mere third of that. Fortunately, we didn't get time to fully compare the direct range of the four cameras. However, since having the camera, CVP have invested in a bunch of new camera testing tools. So in our future camera reviews, we will have access to some of the best testing kit on the market. Sony have stated that the camera has 15 stops to the dynamic range, and that probably is somewhat accurate. But here are a couple of shots to showcase the dynamic range you're looking at out of the FX9. Just like we did with the R last C500 Mark II test, we wanted to shoot some more corporate headshots with the, with the goal being to show how a range of skin tones are handled straight out of camera. For this, we shot with Nick, our third party technician, Joel, a sales account manager, and Angelo, who's one of our lens technicians. We set up with a Kino Flow Select 30 as our key and a digital Sputnik 2 foot Voyager as our fill. All of these shots were shot in 6K full frame. XABCI 25p using S Cinetone at the low base with no gain and at 5500 Kelvin with no tint. Straight out of the camera, the skin looks very nice in Cinetone. Tonal transitions are nice and the 7200G Master shows how insanely sharp it is. This test was to see how nice headshots can look straight out of camera using S Cinetone and I think corporate shooters are going to be very happy with how this new profile looks straight out of the box. During the few days we had with the camera, we managed to grab a range of different creative footage. We are currently shooting a video comparing a few of GTEx portable storage solutions, and we wanted to get some pretty shots of the hard drives in a forest location. So we drove down to Epsom Common and spent an hour or so in some fairly heavy rain. We didn't have a rain cover, so this was a pretty good test of the camera's weather ceiling, and it seemed to handle it with no trouble at all. We shot these clips with a range of Sony E-mount lenses, but mainly the 7200G Master, which is a fantastic piece of glass, with a surprisingly good close focus for a 7200. All of these clips were using manual focus, the camera was in Cine EI mode and we shot mainly at the lower base ISO and mainly at 6K 25p. The footage looks great, we underexposed a little so there is some noise present but Resolve's fantastic noise reduction takes care of that and now the footage looks clean. The colours are one thing that I think have been improved massively over the FS7. They look great, greens are natural without being too saturated, it just looks fantastic. We also took the camera down to one of our CVP Fiverr sidekick abouts and got a few usable shots. All of this was filmed in s at the high base ISO 4000 and is straight out of camera. I think considering the subpar lighting, it looks quite nice. The half speed is really nice, but I wish we had shot more 120 frames per second stuff.
So the main creative test we shot was documenting some local hockey, specifically the clashing of the Guildford Flames and Cardiff Devils at Guildford Spectrum. Thank you Flames for the hospitality, the staff there were fantastic. We took a range of lenses and shot using a mix of resolutions, frame rates and focusing modes. We shot in custom mode in S-Log3, at ISO 4000 base with zero dB gain. Both myself and Joe took turns shooting and because we couldn't use a set of sticks, everything is shot from the shoulder. Just like the FS7, the FX9 out of the box is fairly decent on the shoulder, but as soon as you put some heavier or longer lenses on, it gets front heavy very quickly. So really, if you're like us and going to be shooting with heavy cine zooms or long telephotos, make sure to get a solid 15mm shoulder plate system and get some weight on the back of it. In regards to usability, it does take a little while to change imaging modes while on the fly. It would be awesome if you could assign imaging and frame rate modes to a user button so you quickly switch between 6K full frame to 2K Super 35, for example, for when you want to shoot 120 frames a second. The lighting in the arena was mediocre to say the least. It's fairly dark and very green. We set our white balance manually and one thing we noticed while doing this was the lack of tint adjustment at the white balance on the home screen. This means you have to dig into the deeper menu system, which isn't ideal. Sony, please fix this. The camera starts up incredibly fast. A lot of operators will appreciate this when so many cameras on the market nowadays are incredibly slow. The thumbnail button on the side of the camera is really easy to hit and is then annoying to get out of. If Sony were to change this, I would say maybe make a tap a user-definable button and then like a two second hold take you to playback mode. I know I've already gushed over the autofocus enough, but I have to mention it again. This is a real test for it considering how fast the action was, but it kept up really well. We set the camera up in the following configuration. AF transition speed seven, AF subject shift sensitivity two, focus area wide and spot, face detection, face priority AF. We only shot with the camera's provided screen and loop. And this was very pleasant to work with. We didn't have any issues with the EVF fogging up and the screen is much easier to judge focus on than the old screen on the FS7. One thing I don't think I appreciate as much before using this camera is the quality of Sony's native E-mount lenses. Like a lot of people, I have a vast collection of EF lenses uh, and use them with Metabones because the autofocus was never good on previous Sony cameras. So the benefits of the speed booster outweighed the cons. However, now we have a full frame sensor and good autofocus, and I can't wait to explore Sony's lenses more thoroughly. For these tests, we had access to a few of Sony's flagship primes and zooms, but the pair we kept coming back to was the 24-105 f4 OSS and the 7200 f2.8 G Master OSS. Both of these lenses performed fantastically, especially the 7200. This lens is incredible. It's sharp, it's clean, has fast autofocus, and has a remarkable close focus distance of 0.96 meters, or 3.15 feet. If you want to see a more in-depth review of the Sony's 200, let us know in the comments below. We shot all of the GTEC and hockey footage in S-Log3, which when using the FS7 did have its pitfalls. However, now because of the camera's increased sensitivity and LUT support, as well as the new ability to have a viewfinder gamma assist Rec 709-800 LUT in the viewfinder at all times, no matter if you were in slow and quick or not, made shooting and monitoring S-Log easy. Overall, the image quality looks great. We did underexpose a little in a lot of these shots and you can see some noise starting to creep in. However, a bit of noise reduction in Resolve goes a long way. The colors look great, skin tones have seen a big improvement over the FS7 for sure. I do wish we had shot some more 120 frames a second footage, but the 4K50 and the 6K25 stuff we captured looks really nice. When we hit post, we did have a few issues with getting the clips into Resolve, but not Premiere. But this must be because of the pre-production nature of this review. We simply transcoded all of the clips that weren't behaving into ProRes 42HQ and got to work. The footage graded as you expect from S-Log3. For this grade, we used a Venice 709 LUT as our starting off point and got a bit creative with the Moody grade. While shooting, we only realized after a few shots that the camera had a plus 26 tint for some reason, but we managed to change it only after a few shots, so it was fine. However, some of those shots with that tint were extremely green. 
Luckily, it was fairly easy to make them look pretty nice. We found editing and playing back at XAVCI 4K an absolute breeze while editing on our main rigs. Even with our very large Premiere Pro project, playback was great. I do wish that we had a chance to shoot some more controlled creative tests, but unfortunately we did not get the time to do so. But in the future, we'll make sure we do when we do our firmware update videos for the FX9. Car designer Sir Alec Isagonis coined the phrase, a camel is a horse designed by committee. But the FX9 is an example that this isn't always the case. For Sony, listening to its end users has shaped and defined this camera. The FS7 Mark II definitely wasn't perfect, and neither is the FX9, but Sony have gotten it pretty damn close. Is it worth the extra over the FS7 Mark II? Well, that's down to you, but if you'd ask me, I'd say yes. Not only is the sensor fundamentally better than the FS7 in every way, but it's also a better camera to use day in, day out. A lot of people in our last video asked for downloadable links, so we thought we'd give everyone the chance to download some of the test clips and have a play. We have separated the clips out into the following, s Home rushes, some of our control test rushes, and some of our favorite creative shoot rushes. This is only for you to download and test and play with, so please don't use it for any professional or business purpose. If you got this far, well done. Let us know what you think of the FX9 in the comments below. And if you liked the video, please hit like. And if you want to make sure you're always up to date with our content, make sure you're subscribed and have notifications enabled. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.